Coming up on primetime, you'll see the play of the year, engineered by the Eagles' Randall Cunningham. But the birds were buffaloed by the Bills, who also loved the aerial route. In Washington, the Skins were on the warpath, taking dead aim at the Dolphins. It was an odd week, so the Bengals remembered to show their stripes. Not Tigers, but Lions and Bears. Oh my, for five quarters. Five straight 300-yard passing game, as Warren tries again to run and shoot for the moon. Raiders try to be sky high and mile high. Welcome to my nightmare. Primetime is here. tell you about it here on NFL primetime hello once again everybody I'm Chris Berman and what a ball game they have between the Eagles and the Buffalo Bills we can't wait to show you that we can't wait to tell you what happened in week 13 to help us uh, tell you all Tom Jackson Pete Axtome and Robin Roberts back for a couple weeks first though let's get you updated on the late games around the NFL the Raiders and the Broncos very cold day at Mile High Stadium the Broncos driving 33 seconds to go they're trailing the Raiders 23 to 20. We'll keep you updated on that game, show you highlights a little bit later on. The Houston Oilers are kicking off in overtime to the Seattle Seahawks to start that fifth stanza. They are tied at 10-10 in the Kingdom. Phoenix Cardinals spotted the Colts a big lead, came back to beat them in the land of the sun, 20 to 17. San Diego Chargers rolled up on the Jets for the second time this season, 38 to 17. And the Dallas Cowboys are in the hunt. They spotted the Saints a lead and came from behind to win at 17-13. Troy Aikman, 11 straight completions at one point in the second half. Speaking of teams in the hunt, the Green Bay Packers and the Minnesota Vikings. A month ago, the game looked like a dud. But tonight, the Packers go into it having won three straight in the first on NFL primetime. Tonight's analysis is brought to you by Acura Automobile. Experience precision crafted performance. NFL Primetime is brought to you by Budweiser, the king of beer, with that clean, crisp, cold taste. Nothing beats a bud. By Subaru, we built our reputation by building a better car. By GE Spacemaker Radios and TVs to make your kitchen a nicer place to be. And by Cooper Tools, manufacturer of the new Luskin Series 2000, the most advanced measuring tape on the market. Welcome back to Primetime. We'd like to welcome all of you that have just watched the Raiders hold on to defeat the Denver Broncos 23-20 to at Mile High Stadium. David Treadwell, the Broncos, missed a chip shot with just seconds to go. And so the Raiders have swept the Broncos this season, and the Broncos' losing streak now at five. And we'll have highlights of that a little bit later on. Let's begin our tour around the NFL with the Lions and the Bears, who are the oldest franchise in the league. Would it be a change of fortunes? Last week, the Bears had a big loss. Were they vulnerable? Last week, actually 10 days ago on Thanksgiving, the Lions had a big win. Were they getting set to make that December run as they did a year ago? Such a tough question, we had to go to an extra quarter to answer it. A beautiful day at Soldier Field if you're a polar bear. Cold, windy, a oh, little canoe on Lake Michigan, of course, and a black and blue to bigger The football track. is always the same in the NFC Central. Nico Noga drills Johnny Bailey, separates him from the ball. And here, Rodney Pete trying to get out of bounds, and he takes the big hit by Ron Rivera. NFC football at its best. Like Rodney replaced his contacts in the third quarter. He was replaced at quarterback by Bob Galliano, who hits X Niner Terry Greer. Then eight yards to Richard Johnson. Galliano moves this football team. We've noticed it every time he's in. Third and two, the play action, the 22-yard toss to Richard Johnson. And the Lions are thinking about an upset at Soldier Field for the second straight year. 17-14, Wayne Font said, yeah, good move putting in Galliano. More payoff for the Lions in the three-point lead. Galliano the dump to Barry Sanders. And look at him work. Look at him just change directions. This play, a pickup of 30 yards, gets the Lions out of the shadow of their own goalpost. More time off the clock. Galliano runs out. Singletary doesn't really make the slide. Singletary hits him. Galliano is okay after about a minute breather. Under three minutes to go. It's a big mistake. Ron Rivera with the interception and the Bears down three. 
are looking for a win or maybe a tie. Jim Harbaugh brings it back. Here he goes out of the backfield in the conservatory with the lead pipe. It's Brad Colonel Muster for 17 yards. Then Harbaugh, you know he can run it, keeps it himself. Look at Chris Spielman. Inbounds, but kind of a shaky call. They add a late hit, and that really helped the Bears go to the wire. In overtime, the Lions stopped the deep. They kicked a short field goal. Mike Ditka wins the toss, elected to kick to the win. And so the Lions, with the first possession, have a shot at a field goal, but no, Eddie was not Murray. No good, a 35-yarder. Then, four minutes to go in the OT, Harbaugh, Neil Anderson, it's done, it's a done deal. The Bears hold off the Lions in OT. There's Harbaugh throwing 39 times, uncharacteristic for the Bears. Wayne Fonts wears his emotions on his face, so does Mike Ditka, really. A very good game, but the Bears, as they've done so many times, come out on top by the count of 23-17. to 17. And, Tommy, the, uh, the Chicago offense, now they threw a lot more than usual, but still, wouldn't you call it a safe one? Well, I think that whole offense is safe. It's a good game plan by Mike Dicker. I don't think that he has ultimate confidence in Harbaugh. They win with the running game and defense, so he nickels and dimes the Lions all day. But when they had the opportunity in the overtime and they saw a pattern come open that they like, he allows him to throw the ball. And the numbers, 39 tosses, you know, maybe he's gaining that confidence in Harbaugh as the season goes on. Well, we all know that Ditka doesn't have tremendous confidence in the whole club. He's been saying that this club isn't quite as good as its record, to say the least. And I think he's right. But there's something else working here. Call it character. Whether it comes from coaching, whether it comes from the tradition of the Chicago Bears, these guys seem to win the close ones, and they've been doing it all year. I think they're going to keep it up. And even though they threw more today, they're still the only team in the NFL that has run for more yards than they have passed. It doesn't hurt to have Neil Anderson sneak out of the backfield as a receiver either. So the Bears, as they did 10 years ago in overtime on Thanksgiving, remember that when Dave Williams returned the kickoff for a touchdown? Some of us do. They beat the Lions again in OT. Now, the Lions won the coin toss today. Only the second time they've won a coin toss and lost the game. When they lose a coin toss, it's 0-6. But the key here, they lost the overtime coin toss. They lost the game. You can tell early with Detroit. 25, 27 years ago, Lou Christie, lightning striking again. Last Sunday night on ESPN, you saw the Chargers fumble in overtime. Seattle got it, won it in overtime. Same thing happened for the Seahawks. The Oilers fumbled the ball their first possession in overtime. Seattle turned it into a Norm Johnson field goal, 42 yards. And the Seahawks stunned Houston 13-10. to 10. Now everything is over. Thanks for joining us. We'll show you highlights of that a little bit later on. Let's go back early and let's go east, Robin, as the Los Angeles Rams, coming off their big win of the 49ers, they know that one more loss than any playoff hopes they're out of there. So they couldn't afford to look past the lowly Browns today. No, they couldn't. You really thought this game was going to mean something when you saw it at the beginning of the year, the Rams and the Browns, but it really didn't mean something for the Rams. But you couldn't help but wonder if they would be kind of flat after their upset win over the Niners last, last week. But then again, they were facing the Browns in Cleveland, and the Browns have lost a club record five straight at home and six straight overall. Last week, Jim Shoffman said he thought his Browns wouldn't lose another game all year. Right. Brown showed signs of a 2-9 team. Brian Brennan muffs the punt. It's recovered by Pat Terrell, and the Rams get it again. But John Robinson's team at 4-7 hasn't exactly been so great either. Three plays later, Brent after Miss Brennan's muff. Cleveland Gary fumbles. The ninth time he's done that this year, and the Browns' David Grayson recovers. In the second quarter, Rams with the Browns' two-yard line. Gary is stopped short of the goal line by Mike Johnson. Rams only two of nine on fourth down conversions, but fourth and goal, they go for it. Jim Everett, the play action fake, hits Pete Holohan in the end zone. Rams take a 10-3 lead on the Rams' next possession. Everett again finds Gaston Green. He sprints down the right sideline, 16 yards for the score. It's 17-3 Rams. More the same in the second half. Everett hits Henry Ellert over the middle for Ellert's 400th career reception, TJ. Here, Henry Ellert cuts inside of Raymond Claiborne, makes a good break toward the ball. Knows how to get that head down right after he makes that catch. And Claiborne had a pull groin. We should say that here, Ellett makes a catch to become the Rams' all-time leading receiver. He's 
an outstanding receiver for that a long is, time. Surpassing Tom Spears. More of the same for the Rams. Everett finds Robert Delfino for a 21-yard scoring play. And then Everett again to Buford McGee. A nine-yard scoring play. 38-17 Rams. They scored on their first three second-half possessions. Everett, 22 of 29 for 261 yards. Four touchdown passes. He hadn't tossed a touchdown pass in his last three games. So bad that Browns owner Art Modell couldn't bear to watch as the Rams pull out the victory. 38 to 23. The Browns have now given up 338 points this season, their most since 1983. Would the Falcons be able to snap their 16-game road losing streak? The six-game losing streak brought out the bagheads in Tampa. Falcons also on the ground, led by Mike Rozier with some tough running. Falcons gained 222 yards on 43 carries into the first quarter. Falcons score on the ground. A four-yard run by the outstretched Tracy Johnson made it 7-0 Falcons. First round pick Keith McCants made his first NFL start. It was kind of rough for him, TJ. Offensive line of the Falcons welcoming him to the NFL. Here they blow him off the ball about five yards, and for Keith it would be that way all day. Second quarter, Falcons up 7-zip, but Vinny Testaverde finds the streaking Willie Drury. He's going to take off 89 yards for the score. It's a 7-all ball game. Chris Miller having his problems. First, Ricky Reynolds picks Miller off. Then Rodney Rice does the same after the deflection. Both led to Buck field goal, 13-7 at the half. Buck fans, good reason to smile. Third quarter, things got worse for Miller. He scrambles out of the end zone, tackled by the rookie McCant, fracturing his right collarbone. Miller was four for 13 at that point. Three interceptions, only 66 yards. He is gone for the season, though. Jerry Glanville's Graceland watch said it was time to run again. Mike Rozier, nine-yard run. Rozier again. This time, he's going to bull his way into the end zone, put the Falcons on top, 14-13. to Rozier, 23 carries, 115 yards, and one score. It's 17-16 Falcons, less than a minute to go. Ray Perkins telling Vinny what to do, and Vinny responds, going 35 yards to Mark Carrier for the score. 23-17 Bucks, Vinny 17-33 of for 351 yards, only one interception. Gary Glanville, not a happy camper. The Falcons lose their 17th on the road by a final of 23 to 17. The Bucks snap their six-game losing streak and move to five and eight. Falcons have lost five straight, their last 17 away from Fulton County Stadium. They're now three and nine. And with Miller out, it's going to be tough for them. He's going to be gone for the year. Won't be able to throw a ball for four or five months. Scott Campbell inherits the job, and he's a pretty good backup. Bob Berry or somebody, maybe they should look for the original general, Robert Bob Lee. But uh Falcons are going to have a tough time winning at home now, but we know they have real trouble on the road because with that loss today at Tampa Bay, the Falcons' dubious road losing streak is now the fourth longest in the history of the NFL. But don't worry, they've got six to go before they tie the 81 through 84 Houston Oilers and the mid-80 Buffalo Bills. They've got five to go to tie them, but this list is not good to be on. We'll be back. Minnesota Vikings look to make it five in a row against the Green Bay Packers and quarterback Anthony Dilway live on ESPN. Live and kicking earlier today at Rich Stadium in Buffalo. A couple of NFL heavyweights, the Philadelphia Eagles, winners of five in a row, and the Buffalo Bills, co-owners of the best record in the AFC at nine and two going in. And it was a real heavyweight fight. The Bills scored early. Eagles scored big in the middle round, but it was Buffalo that was left with a couple of punches to pull out the decision. And I'll tell you what, Ray Bentley, one of his heroes is Alice Cooper. He was no more Mr. Nice Guy. He paints his eyes that way every now and then. Not often a nice guy. Andre Muddy Waters, clean hit on Thurman Thomas with the flip. Shane Conlon with the stick on Keith Barr Sherman on the goal line. It was that sort of game. But I'll tell you what nobody in Philadelphia was expecting. Jim Kelly to James Lawson. And look at him go. The veteran races across the field. And he could go all the way. 63 yards. The Bills lead at 7-0. Hundred touchdown pass in the career of Jim Kelly. With the score 10-0 still in the first. A quick slant to Andre Reid. And guess what he's going to do? He beats Waters and Wes Hopkins. He goes all the way. 56 yards. 17-0. Buffalo. Buffalo employing the no-huddle offense here. Kelly alert to the blitz. Both outside linebackers come. Middle of the field open. Andre Reed showing that speed that nobody suspects that he has. He just beats everybody to the end zone all the time. 
comes in. No huddle offense. Kelly to wide off and lost it. He fakes Waters. Finally is run out of bounds. This set up a Thurman Thomas touchdown, and the Bills would lead it 24-0 at the end of the first quarter for Lofton, 174 yards, receiving more on that later. And for Jim Kelly, his first 300-yard day of the season, passing defensively while the Bills were running up a big lead. Bruce Smith made sure it stuck that way for a while. In all likelihood, the fastest lineman off the ball in the NFL. And here he goes around Ron Heller. I don't even know if Ron Heller got a whiff of him there. Forces the bad throw. And he looks like he's offside on this play. He is not. He knocks the ball out of Randall Cunningham's grasp. It was not ruled a fumble. They did not even review it. In the second quarter, Randall Cunningham was exactly where he wanted to be. Down 24 to nothing. On second and nine. Nobody open. Oh, that's gonna be <laughs> he cuts back. Randall ran for 71 yards on the day. 40 on this play. Look at this is a quarterback. Give us a break. And on second and seven from the 18. Certainly shows he's a quarterback here. The great play fake to Tony. And then shows that nice touch that he has when he gets inside the 20. And oh, let me tell you about two Jackson. They missed the kick in at 24 to 6. Late in the second quarter, third and 14. The play of the year, folks. Randall Cunningham in the end zone. Bruce Smith goes in for the sack. No, he doesn't get the sack. Running against his body. Throws it 60 yards. Fred Barnett makes the catch. Are you kidding? 95 yard touchdown from Cunningham to Fred Barnett. Rich Stadium stunned as the Eagles are shooting their way back in the ball game. I'm not sure I believe it, Tom. The great athleticism of Randall Cunningham here. I think he got a peek behind him right there at Bruce Smith. He manages to duck out of it, keeps his poise, keeps his head and eyes upfield and unleashes this ball off the wrong foot. It's all arm, and he throws it about 60 yards, and he can still go all the way. There's <laughs> a habit for me here. In the third quarter, on third and goal, Cunningham to Keith Byers. He threw a 95-yarder, went after a one-yarder, and it's a 24-23 Buffalo lead in the fourth quarter. It's now 30-23, to and here comes the sack machine. Cornelius Bennett gets to Cunningham. Then, does Randall have one play left? Down by a touchdown, 13 seconds to go. The hook and ladder. Out of bounds with seven seconds to go. You know he can throw it all the way into the end zone. The Hail Mary, but can he throw it 80 yards? Almost far enough, but batted away. And the Bills remain undefeated at home this year. For Marv Levy, they're 7-0 in Rich Stadium. And the Bills beat the Philadelphia Eagles 30-23 in a wild, wild ball game. Nothing wilder than the play made by Randall Cunningham. It was designed. I was supposed to drop back, fake to the right, then Bruce Smith was supposed to come and I was supposed to duck. <laughs> <laughs> he was supposed to jump over me and I was supposed to hit Calvin, but I had to go to Freddie. <laughs> I guess the whole team knew that there was certain individuals in Buffalo that said we weren't going to win any games in December, and we wanted to shove it down a couple guys' throats, period. Also in that ball game, James Lofton, a couple of milestones for him. He's one of those guys that he's just still fast, like Isaac Curtis, like Cliff Branch, like Wesley Walker, like Harold Jackson. Today, bad day for Don Maynard because on the receiving list, Lofton passed Ray Berry and Don Maynard, now sixth all-time in receptions. He also passed the Jet Hall of Famer on the all-time yardage list. Lofton now almost 12,000 yards. By the end of the year, he'll be second to only Steve Largent in that category. But let's get back to the ball game, Tommy. Uh, obviously, the Bills uh, scoring a lot today. And even though Randall was impressive at times, he had his hands full with the Bills' rush. Well, Chris, you, you talked about the maturing of Jim Kelly, and we saw more of the same of that today. But I thought that the biggest job on the day belonged to uh, Bruce Smith, Cornelius Bennett, and Daryl Talley. And even though Randall Cunningham did make the big plays uh, three or four during the day, I thought they did a pretty good job of containing him or, you know, Philadelphia has the capabilities of putting up 35, 40 points. I'll tell you what's uh, been lost in all this is the, is the fact that the Buffalo Bills, well, now you see it, they've scored more points than anybody in the NFL. They have a big play offense, and if they are at home in January with the best record in the AFC, I'm going to go out, I'm going to tell you right now, they're the Super Bowl team for the AFC. They're 21-2 and two in Rich Stadium the last three years. They're at home in January. You can just about kiss it goodbye. 
Miami, the team that would like not to let the Bills be at home, also started the day atop the AFC East at 9-2. and two. They had a tough task, knocking helmets with the Washington Redskins. Let's go to RFK Stadium, where Don Shula and his defensive coordinator, Tom Alabadotti, had the number one defense in football. But they played the Hogs today, and it was a different story, mainly because of this man, Gerald Briggs out, Ernest Biner in. Biner up the middle for 11 very quick yards, so he still shows the quickness. Then Biner darting back and forth up the middle for a touchdown. 21 to 3 Washington at the half before the Dolphins even knew what was going on. Play made famous here by the Washington Redskins. Counter trade, the offside guard, tackle, pull. Biner follows right, right, follows them in the hole. Cuts back, makes about seven yards on the play. Then Ernest Biner with more. 21 up the middle. Dakey keeps going 13. Biner again. This time he's up the middle for a touchdown. And the Skins lead at 35 6 in the third. For Ernest Biner, welcome back big time. 157 yards and three touchdowns. First 100-yard game rushing allowed by the Dolphins this year. Meanwhile, Mark Rippon was reading. Here he sees Gary Clark, member of the posse. Nice catch by Clark, 47 yards, and here it is again. Yeah, that'll work. Rippon, talked about the venerable James Lofton. What about? Ah, the Monk. Seven yards. Monk into the end zone for a touchdown. Rippon to Monk again. Ten catches for 92 yards for Art Monk today. A pair of touchdowns, including this leaper in the back of the end zone. Mark Rippon, 21 of 28 on the day. Three touchdown passes, two for 245 yards. And while we were saying hail to the Redskins, what went wrong with my ass? Well, I think their problems began defensively with poor tackling. Here you see Biner get the ball for his third touchdown. Number 77, Carl Wilson. Misses him at the line of scrimmage, and that's just something the Dolphins have not been doing this year. Here you see Biner again getting the football. Cliff Odom has a shot at him at the line of scrimmage, but can't bring him down. He goes for the extra five, and then finally Brian Mitchell around the corner with Hugh Green making the miss. They also had a bit of poor pass coverage. Here you see Ricky Sanders running wide open, and you just can't do that when you're playing in the pocket. And even everybody got into the scoring column. Jimmy Johnson. Yeah, he got a touchdown from Rippin. Today, it was Rippin that made Dan Marino and the Dolphins jealous as the Dolphins fall from first place in the AFC East. They were lambasted uh, by Washington 42-20. to And frankly, Pete, today, Miami looked overmatched. Well, they were. Physically, they were overmatched. Uh, and it reminds you that while the Dolphins have made great strides this year, they still have only beaten one good team all year. The good news for them is that team was Buffalo. They beat him in Joe Robbie, and they'll have to do it again in Rich Stadium. That'll be a little tougher, but Miami still might sneak in there. Well, they could, but that's December 23rd. Christmas shopping in Buffalo for Miami. That is week 16. The Dolphins have lost to the Giants, as you mentioned, the Raiders and the Skins, all teams with big, tough offensive lines. We come back. The Steelers and the Bengals atop the AFC Center. ago Cincinnati beat Pittsburgh 27-3 last week they lost so you knew what would happen this week when they played the Steelers again too bad for Pittsburgh it was the wrong week all right let's go as the good news for the Bengals Anthony Munoz back in the lineup for Sam Weiss along with Bruce Reimers the two linemen hurt last week Chuck Noll looking for career win number 200 but in the first quarter down three nothing he watched the play fake nobody's better at it than Boomer we've said it repeatedly on the show Eddie Brown is open makes the move around Thomas Everett it goes 50 yards and very quickly it's a 10 nothing Cincinnati lead Tom it is a great play fake Chris you see Boomer not only hide the ball with his body but put it on his hip and then if you watch the coverage as it's frozen here, three defenders running with McGee. Here comes Eddie Brown across the field in the opposite direction. Breaks the tackle and moves into the end zone for a touchdown. Score is 7-3 Cincinnati. And with the score after field goal made 7-6, the Bengals threaten again, but they fumble the ball. So maybe that was Norman Esiason. Soon thereafter, Bubby Brister, when you're in the end zone, Tony, you got to get rid of it. Yeah, and right here, he has to throw this ball away. He has to know that he can't afford the safety there. Big turnaround. So that was a two-point play there, and on the ensuing free kick, the Bengals turn it into a touchdown. So nine points makes it 16-6 Cincinnati at the half. James Brooks didn't get 100 for the fourth straight time against the Steelers, but he had 81 impressive yards. And Bengal fans, yeah, they were out in their stripes. 
It's like uh, Fred Edelstein at the game. And anyway, Louis Litt left the game in the first half, came back with a deep back bruise, and Bobby Brister used him repeatedly. 14 yards, 11 yards, set up a Gary Anderson field goal, made it 69, fourth quarter. Bobby, hold him a tail by Louis Lips for another 20 yards. Seven catches for 97 for Louis Lips, and that set up the fourth field goal of the day for Gary Anderson, who is the second fastest player to reach the 200 field goal mark in the NFL. Only Jan Stederud has done it faster than Anderson. Big Steeler defensive play on third and one. Keith Willis beats Brooks, and the Bengals have to punt. The terrible towels making a return this year at Three Rivers. The Steelers drive to the sixth. They call timeout now. They don't give him one. When two men were in motion, Bobby said, we need a timeout. The clock continues to run. Bobby says, all right, let's run. Why they didn't get a timeout, nobody is sure. But then when they try and call the play, uh, too much time. And so this, coupled with a couple incompletions, enraged Chuck Knoll and set the Steelers up on fourth down. Only Bill Russell could have caught that pass, not Eric Green. The Bengals take over on downs, and the Bengals beat the Steelers for the second time in three weeks to go back on top alone in the AFC Central. Chiefs at the Patriots. Patriot fans don't want to show their faces. They haven't won since before the Lisa Olsen incident, week two. That was after week two. This week, Steve DeBerg, early on, like first play from scrimmage, to Stephon Pace, 86 yards. I mean, get the pole out of the way. Nobody was ready for this. 7-0 Kansas City. DeBerg, he has not crumbled this year. He's stayed a solid quarterback. This to Rob Thomas, this to Todd McNair. He is no longer throwing the INTs, and when you eliminate that from his game, Chris, suddenly you have an outstanding quarterback. And, of course, against New England, I mean, it's not exactly like you're playing against the 49ers or the Giants. So this is 59 yards to J.J. Burton, or any other NFL team for that matter. DeBerg in the first half threw for 312 yards. That's the first half. Meanwhile, Rod Russ says, well, let's try to run again. All right, John Stevens. No. Then, John Stevens, tackled by Bruce Armstrong, the best blocker. So, Rod Russ says, All right, uh, let's try the pass. The youngster Tommy Hodgson starting. George Adams isn't looking. Kevin Ross is, almost picks it off. Hodgson is around Cherry Cherry in the end zone, picks it off, and Hodgson, wide. Rod Russ says, well, you know what we can do? We could punt. No. Albert Lewis blocked it, his fourth block of the season. And at least it's something to look forward to, the first draft pick. Chiefs running game took over from there. Barry, never a discouraging word. Ran for 112 yards. And even when backup quarterback Steve Pollard hey, falls down, Christian Okoye scores one of his two touchdowns anyway. Bag it, New England. The Chiefs roll 37 to seven. The Saints at the Cowboys. Steve Walsh, now a member of the New Orleans Saints, returning to Big D to face his old team. The reason that Walsh is gone, Troy Aikman. Who's the better quarterback? You take a look. In the first half, Walsh, 22 yards. To get a penalty. Then Walsh to Floyd Turner. 11 yards. And that's set up. Tubin Mays, Ironhead with a big block, 15-yard touchdown by Mays, 10-0 Saints at the half. Second half, a different story. First play from scrimmage, Aikman. And he just continues to impress us every week, Tommy, to Kelvin Martin. This play, this little hitch, is turned into a 45-yard screamer. Then a plan B for agents that's paid off big time. Jay Novacek across, makes a couple of moves, sets up an Emmett Smith touchdown. It's 10 7, New Orleans. After St. Field goal makes it 13 7, Aikman to Michael Irvin. Then Aikman, who completed 11 in a row in the second half, 15 yards to Kelvin Martin. Setting up five yarder to Daryl Johnston. The Cowboys lead 14 13 in the fourth. Yeah, in the second half, uh, pretty good rating right there. Saints had one last chance to get the win, but Ironhead at the inception. Oh, it's a bad day! And Dallas recovers. And the Saints' vision of a wild card playoff berth has gone by, and the Cowboys are six and seven. By the way, both Aikman and Walsh passed exactly the same yardage 
177 yards, but the Cowboys have won three in a row. They win it 17 to 13. The Cowboys get the week off next week, and uh, they're in the hunt. The Saints loss gives the Niners the NFC West. When we return, we'll show you what happened at Mile High, another 20,000 league downer for the Broncos. But today we showed you some of the long passes. Three of the five longest touchdown passes of the season happened today. Randalls of 95 yards. Vinny's today to Willie Soviet Drury and Steve DeBerg's touchdown ball today. Budweiser still has these horses. Will Bud Light find a quarterback? Ken Budweiser three peaks. For Bud Bowl Update, I'm Chris Berman. Who was that guy anyway? And the game we've all been waiting for in week 13. Phoenix and Indianapolis. Hey, the Colts are on the move. They were. They were on the move. Yes, now you gave it away. Oh, well, you already I'm did that earlier. But they're, I, I owe you. You, they're a good team in the second half, you got to say, of the season. Since replacing Rod Dauhauer in 1986, Ron Meyer is 21 and 9 in the second half of the season when coaching the Colts. Heading into today's game with the Cardinals, they were 3 and 0 since the break, going for their first 4 and 0 streak since 88. But you know what? Garth Jacks, the Cardinals linebacker, sideline because he was bitten severely on the foot trying to break up a dog fight. Rough game on the field as well. Johnny Johnson re-injures his bad ankle on a sweep. The terrific rookie would not return. Any quarterback, Jeff George, was knocked down by Freddie Joe Nunn. And the Colts running game has improved. Albert Bentley doing the job in the first quarter, going for 12 yards. Then on the delay for 16 more, Eric Dickerson was held in check for most of the day, but the Colts still ran well in the first half. A strong running sets up a play action on fourth and one, George. So wide open. Anthony Johnson for the easy score. It's 10-6, Colts at the half. Third quarter, George goes to the air. To Jesse Hester on the slant. And Hester sprints 46 yards before he's caught from behind. Then the card's 27-yard line. Then Hester, again, loses his man at the line of scrimmage and catches a rocket from George at 17-6, Colts. But the cards, they get the break. Third and 15, Tim Rosenbaugh throws incomplete, but Chip Banks come in way, he comes in way late. That gives Phoenix the first down. It sets up this Tim Rosenbaugh plunge from the one, 17-13 Indy. Then the big play, eight minutes left. George underthrows Hester, and Cedric Mack intercepts. And then he, he laterals over to Marcus Turner, who scampers in for the game, winning touchdown. Dexter Manley says, I, must, I think we like playing with the Cardinals. I like that exciting kind of play. 2017 Cardinals with the victory. Dickerson held the three and a half yards to carry only 17 carries for 60 yards. Let's check in on the Jets. And the lightning bolt in San Diego, Bruce Coslett had a lot to be worried about in the first half. Chargers punt, Donnie Elder saves the ball and the Chargers down the ball in the one yard line. Ken O'Brien in his own end zone. He is intercepted by Donald Frank. It would set up a Miriam Butts touchdown run. O'Brien this time completes to Chris Dressel who fumbles. The Chargers recover. Sets up another Butts touchdown run. Pat Leahy had made 17 in a row, but not this time. Doesn't make 18, missing the 36-yarder. Dan Henning and the Chargers led 17-10 at the half, third quarter. Billy Joe Tolliver looks to the end zone and he finds Anthony Miller. A 24-yard scoring play, charges up 24 to 10. Oliver fired up as the Jets gained momentum. Bruce Costley can't seem to get a break. Ken O'Brien brought the Jets back. O'Brien connects with his favorite receiver, Al Soon. Eight yards out, charges lead cut to 24-17. Dan Henning feeling the heat of a Jet comeback. Marion Butts got mean, though. Butts going 13 yards on the right side. Butts straight up the middle. 18 yards, just simply taking tacklers down with him. Oliver looks to the end zone and finds Nate Lewis. A 19-yard scoring play, the first of his career. Chargers up 31-17. Butts wasn't finished. Breaks tackles. Goes 52 yards to set up another touchdown. Marion Butts with 26 carries on the day. 159 yards, two touchdowns as the Chargers win 38-17. And Marion Butts, the first to go over the 1,000-yard mark with 1,154 yards. Marion Butts, as you say. You like those lightning bolts? I do. I they're do. strong. You know I do. I think they're on their way. Maybe not this year, a year or so away, but uh, they're showing the good signs. And the Jets were on their way, but they're really scuffling here the last part of the season. When we return, mile high between the Broncos and the Raiders. Overtime between the Oilers and the Seahawks. But first, 100-yard receivers. Yeah, top of the list. Senior citizen. You just 
hate for me to have him call him that, but James Lofton, the still mercurial, Stepan Page, really Soviet Drury. And I wonder how Fred Barnett got 100 yards. Thanks, Randall. We've got Chris Coleman of the Vikings. And we've got for Green Bay, Timmy Harris. You gotta believe us, we're gonna have Timmy Harris at the top of the hour as the Vikings play the Green Bay Packers. All right. We also have the Raiders and the Denver Broncos for you right now. From Mile High Stadium, they, began, they met week one. The Raiders won at 14-9. Kind of been a downer for the Broncos ever since. Could they get back today on a cold and blustery day in Mile High? All eyes on Jay Schrader. Didn't know until Friday if he's going to be started with his injured left knee. Down screen up to the first. Schrader comes up gunning. 22 yards to Willie Galt over the middle. Then back to Galt, who toys for 18 more yards. Pretty good, huh? Then it's Ethan Horton with a nifty one-handed grab. And Hort spins down to the three-yard line. Was Schrader ready to play early or what? Six for six on the first series for 74 yards. Steve Smith punches it in. 7-3 L.A. for both out. John Elway taking a lot of abuse this season, but on third and long, Tommy looks like the old John E. Here, Elway scrambling toward the sideline, but I love this about him. He refuses to run out of bounds, tries to run over two Raiders instead. And then Elway does the pass for 21 yards. It's a touchdown. Dan Reeves and company win it 10 to 7, a lead at 10-7. Second half, yeah, you've seen this, Tom. Raiders and Broncos renewing acquaintances. Scott Davis renewing acquaintances with John Elway. Forces Elway up in the pocket here where Howie Long brings him down for the sack. Another guy charge up Bo Jackson. Burk, burk, and burk. And he's gone. Look, get him go. Bo is the Bronco on that play, like Bronco Nagurski. 62 yards, 20 to 13, Los Angeles. Bo's day, thanks in part to that one. 13 carries, a buck 17 for two touchdowns. With the score, 23-20 LA. The Broncos trying to come back. Under two minutes to go. Elway to Vance Johnson for a 28-yard pickup. Yes, the feet are inbound. With seven seconds to go, the tying field goal, David Treadwell, it's blocked. And let's see what happened here. Jerry Robinson gets some penetration, gets his hands way up in the air, blocks it with the right hand. And I couldn't see anything wrong with that kick, just a great effort by Robinson. Wasn't a chip shot as we thought before, but it doesn't matter. It wasn't good, and the Raiders keep pace with the Kansas City Chiefs in the AFC West, winning 23-20. The Oilers, could they stay in first in the AFC Central? Run and shoot offense, got a lot of rest early against Dave Craig and the Seattle Seahawks. And doing what they do best, ball control. The number one receiver in the AFC is fullback John L. Williams. Derek Fenner, a large addition of the ground chuck game of the Seahawks. Here runs for 10 yards, keeping Warren Moon and company off the field. Moon watched as Chris Warren ran it in, and the Oilers were behind 7-3 at the half. When Moon got on the field, it wasn't good. The Oilers, who for the first time this year on their first possession, actually punted the ball. He got harassed. Moon then remembered that Jacob Green could still sack the passer. And when he tried to take matters into his own hands, he couldn't do it. He dropped the ball to the and Seattle recovered. First half, 54 yards for the run and shoot shooting itself in the foot. The moon charged back in the second half. Ernest Givens from Louisville. Short pass for touchdown. We're tied at 10. No dancing on this play. Alan Pinkett bobbles it. James Jefferson makes a nice interception. But the Oilers get it right back on a controversial call. Melvin Jenkins called for a defensive push on Hayward Jeffries. Ooh, that's a tough call. The ball's inside the 40. Instead of going for the field goal, Pardee decides to go for it. With no timeouts, they go over the middle, and the time runs out. So they go to overtime. First possession for the Oilers. Moon to Bernard, 40, fumbles. Dave Wyman recovers for Seattle, and as they did a week ago on an overtime miscue, Norm Johnson nails it. 41-yarder, it's gone. And very, very, very quietly, the Seahawks are 6-6 six and, six and have a shot. They beat the Oilers 13-10, who looked like a different club than they did on Monday night in their big win over the Buffalo Bills. When we return, the axe 
will, of course, have his word on Philly and Buffalo and other topics of interest. 100-yard rushers, Marion Watts at 159 yards, over 1,000 yards for the season. What a great day for Ernest Beiner. What an unbelievable run for Bo Jackson. Rozier and Barry Word, so five guys over 100 during a day. Vinny, we've been calling for him all year. Threw for 351 yards, leading the passing parade for Week 13. Between the Giants and Niners should be outstanding at Candlestick Park, but uh, so was the Eagles-Buffalo game at Ritz Stadium. Axe, we were all jumping and screaming on that one. Yes, Chris. Uh, you know, for three quarters today, I thought I was watching one of those truly Olympian football games, the kind that gets everybody excited and usually only happens every four years. 24-0 lead. The Eagles last back to 24-23. Randall Cunningham made the type of exquisite pass play that etches itself in the memory. I was in Yankee Stadium when John Unitas waved Raymond Berry downfield. Carl Karlevich, the defender, fell down, and the Colts took the Giants into overtime in perhaps the most pivotal game in the history of NFL popularity. I was on the sideline at the very spot where Duriel Harris caught a Don Stock pass and lateral to Tony Nathan for a touchdown. The hook and trail of play that produced the most exciting game the rickety old Orange Bowl has ever seen. I was in the studio today, but I was getting the same brand of goosebumps. Randall's 95-yard pass to Barnett was the stuff of Unitas legend. Thank God it wasn't ruined by the stupid in the grass rule. I was beginning to think that if a lineman even, even breathed on a quarterback, there would be a whistle. Call it the in the gas rule. But Randall beats all the rules. Today, he couldn't quite beat the Bills. The game was a microcosm of the season. We thought we would have a true Super Bowl tomorrow night, a battle of unbeaten. They both were beaten last week. We've enjoyed the antics of refreshing coaches like Buddy Ryan and Jerry Glanville, but they don't win enough. So naturally, this potential classic between the Eagles and the Bills was lateraled away by Seth Joyner. Then the Eagles' defense jumped offside at a key moment. The message? There are no honeymoons in football this year. Give me three periods of marital bliss. I'll give you 15 minutes of paying alimony. It reminds me of the Shel Silverstein song. Alimony, alimony. I thought I bought steak but it was all baloney. And we handicappers can appreciate the punchline to that verse. I'm paying for my mistakes. Chris? That man always outlook on the social uh, aspects <laughs> of football, Pete Axum. But, you know, and speaking of Randall and the Eagles and looking at that, uh, there are five Heisman Trophy winners running backs in the NFL. Randall has more yards rushing this year than four of the five of them. It's kind of unbelievable, including Marcus, Herschel, Mike Rozier, and Bo Jackson. Only Barry Sanders is more than Randall. That's a, kind of an interesting uh, number broke, uh, gotten up by our crack stat crew. <laughs> Let's take a look at the standings through week 13, where atop the AFC East, it's the Buffalo Bills, who, if they keep rolling, will have home field through the playoffs in January in Buffalo. Of course, Dolphins have something to say about that. With Pittsburgh and Houston losing, of course, Pittsburgh losing to Cincy, it's the Bengals in an odd week who are in first place by themselves in the Central. Out West, Chiefs and Raiders at 8-4, and four, Seattle and San Diego in the hunt, at least wild card hunt, Denver, wide. In the NFC, the Giants have already clinched at least a wild card berth. Washington and Philly at 7-5 and five look to be wild card squads. Dallas is in it in the Central. The Bears clinch a wild card berth with their win in overtime over Detroit. And in the West, the Niners, by virtue of the Saints' loss, have clinched the division. Not that that was a nail-biter, but just thought you'd like to know.